Recording has started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Object Capability Security Sesh here at Decent Social. Um, yes, I was not expecting to do any presentations today, and instead I'm doing like six, so, um, you know, but that's me. That's what happens when I show up at one of these things. Um, so I am, uh, this is, we're talking about Object Capability Security here. Um, just out of curiosity, um, I guess, uh, do a, um, a why in the chat if you know, feel like you know something about uh, object capability security and a minus, or sorry, and an N if you feel like you don't. Okay. So we see a few, a few Y's and a lot of, a lot of the N's, right? So um, let's think about how to think about object capability security. Um, I guess I'll start sharing my screen. I'm gonna um, in just a sec, but um, the the high level that I think is is worth um, going on is that object capability security really just means if you don't have it, you can't use it. So your everything is reference oriented. It's about what you hold on to. So one of the metaphors that's often used, it's very imperfect, is the car key metaphor, right? So we're we're used to thinking of the, the computer. We're used to thinking of computer security, it keeps muting me, I don't know why, uh, as like kind of like a bouncer in a club, right? Like where like, you know, we check this list of who's allowed to do what. And if you're not on the list, you can't, you're, you're not allowed in. Um, that's not the approach we're, we take with object capability security. Instead, it's, it's more like, um, there's a few ways to think of it, but one of them is like um, whether or not you have access to a um, procedure or a reference in a programming language, or also whether or not you have um, uh, access to, um, or whether or not the car key metaphor is whether or not you have access to um, drive a car is whether or not you have the key for that car. So I'm gonna start screen share over here. See if I can, it will not let me full screen my own thing for this recording. That's gonna be very annoying. Um, okay, let's see if we can make it big enough. Um, all right. So, the um, so so the 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 real the different forms of object capability security that you might have are you might have um, the programming language version. Um, there is the um, OCAP URI mechanism, and there are certificate uh, OCAPs. Um, and then, kind of a subset of one of these is the distributed programming. Um, so, but then the then in the external world we have this metaphor that we call the car key metaphor. And what you can imagine is, you know, you've got the car does not scan your face traditionally up until recently, right? Um, it's not whether or not the car scans your face to see whether or not it, um, you're allowed to drive. The car, you know, if you have the key, you can turn it on, you can drive it, right? So whether or not you just have access to this reference gives you access to be able to do the thing. Um, in programming, the the programming way that we usually do this is actually closer to. Um, so I'm going to use kind of JavaScript -y syntax to start out here. Um, but you know, imagine you know I send you an email and I say, hey, you know, here's this program called Solitaire. You know, Solitaire. You know, I guess if you're on Windows, .exe, right? You know, that's a classic version. And it's like just run it. Well, should you do that? Is that unsafe? Usually people think that, well, that's extremely unsafe, right? That's what we've been taught. And that's because the access control list model of, you know, are you allowed into the club or aren't you is an ambient authority system, right? You know, it's what you can do depends on who you are. But what if Solitaire instead booted up in a cold, empty environment? So let's think of Solitaire as like a function in like JavaScript or something like that, right? And Solitaire can't do anything in this cold, empty environment. All it can do is maybe, you know, just return something. So like, you know, result equals Solitaire. Well, that's not particularly interesting. You know, it can run some sort of procedure um, and it can give us some sort of value back. But, you know, if it can't, literally can't perform any effects and all it can do, the, the worst thing it can do is enter an infinite loop and okay, we can kill the process or eat a bunch of memory and okay, we can kill the process. And we can put limits on that. But um, it can't do anything particularly dangerous, but it also can't do anything particularly interesting, right? So imagine we say, okay, well, we need we need something a little bit better than that. So we'll say, okay, we let's say we can make a window, right? So we have in our in our top level environment, let's say we have this powerful procedure called make 
win, right? Solitaire doesn't have access to this, but we have access to it. So we say, okay, um, you know, win for solitaire equals wake, make win, right? And then we say, okay, well, let's pass that in, win for solitaire. And what this window allows solitaire to do is it allows it to um, display to the screen, and it also allows it to read keyboard and mouse events, but only while the window is active. All right, now what can Solitaire do? Well, it can allow us to play Solitaire. Can it do anything dangerous? Well, it can show us a naughty, naughty picture, but it can't do anything else dangerous, right? Can't crypto hard, lock your hard drive, can't do anything like that. Just doesn't have those powers. Um, so you say, okay, well, that's nice, but you know, sometimes I win Solitaire, sometimes I lose it. So sometimes I want, you know, what I really want is a high scores file. So let's imagine we're in this more powerful, high level environment, right? You know, so we're, we're saying, okay, we want, you know, high scores file equals open file, and, you know, I say, you know, solitaire hs.txt. This is my fault, say, five scores. I'll give it read-write access, right? Well, now imagine I pass this in, and now solitaire is able to read and write to this file, but it can't do anything else dangerous. It can't read and write any other arbitrary files on my computer. It can only access that one file, right? Because solitaire boots up as a function with nothing powerful in it. Right. This is not how we're used to our programming languages work, you know. In our programming languages, we say, well, you know, if I want to access the network, I just do import net access, and I get my program can just reach in and do whatever it wants. But what if it wasn't like that, right? What if it? What if you had to pass things around? Now, this actually looks just like ordinary programming. And so when um, when Dave and I talk about object capability security, when we're doing computer uh, programming in in goblins and stuff like that, this is the approach we're taking. It's programming language OCAPs, and that's the approach we take in sprightly goblins and so on and so forth. Um, what if you if you're at Dave's previous talk, um, he showed off uh, the community garden that he wrote, and we're going to do that again in just a second. Um, but what's cool about that is that it provides distributed programming, uh, um, the same mechanisms that you can use to do local language programming can also apply over the network. So you're really just passing around references between procedures and objects, and whatever doesn't have access to anything just doesn't have access to it. You're specifically constructing resources that things are supposed to have access to. Um, another metaphor that you can think of for OCAPs is um, like the, actually this very own link to join this room, right? Or the one to join the crypt pad, right? If you've got some gobbledygook URI, like a Google Docs thing, they've got, you know, docs.google.com slash, and then it's got this big random blob on it, right? And it says anybody who has a link can, you know, read and write the access to that. That's another way you can encode a capabilities. So we use something called sturdy refs, which allow you to start a connection between different processes in goblins. But um, there's other ways to do things that don't have that gobbledygook, you know, on un unguessability. What, one thing that's powerful about programming language OCAPs is that they're unforgeable. There's no way to be able to um, create an OCAP that you don't have. The programming language environment will prevent you from having it. It's like trying to get access to a variable that you simply haven't been uh, handed in a memory safe language. You can't do it, right? You just can't break that barrier. So, um, so the, so, but um, whereas OCAP URIs are unguessable. They're an approximation. So you just, you you can brute force a bunch of numbers to try to guess what this thing's, uh, you know, random looking ID is going to be to try to get access to it. And generally that's what we live with, right? You know, um, and certificate OCAPs also have the same property, but it's on your key, right? And um, certificate OCAPs are another way to do things. I'm not gonna go into them as far. It's kind of a data oriented way of doing OCAPs. I, I co-authored a spec on this called ZCAPLD, which had some amount of attention. Um, I have some amount of regret in that I think ZCAPLD um, ended up looking so much like data that people started to think of it as in terms of data and as in terms of stories, and that can lead you down an accidental uh, ACL like workflow. But what can you do with OCAPs, right? You know, so, because what, what I've shown you here, yeah, you can hand these things around, but maybe, maybe you aren't sure that they can be, you know, can you hold these things accountable, right? Can you revoke them, and et cetera? I'm going to show you that you can, or I'm like, going to show you the accountability half of it. And we're going to do this in real time. So um, before I do that, let's see. Do we have any questions from the audience? I haven't been paying attention to the chat. Are people following me so far? Is this making any sense? OK. Um, people are just asking about the screen. Uh, thumbs up. Makes sense. Cool. All right. Great. Making sense. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's do the, let's, let's, um, 
Dave, I'm gonna we're gonna do it live, right? The thing you're very much so not supposed to do. So, Dave, what am I supposed to do here? <laughs> Reinstand script okay. does not join garden. So it's what is it? Uh, host dash garden. Host dash garden. Let's see what happens. And oh, then, right. Oh, oh, you need two things. Give a garden name, like mm -hmm. in quotes. Do like I, I did decent garden, kind of to be uh, silly, but uh, yeah, yeah. How about how about um, snowflake garden? Because I'm very special. Uh, okay. And and, and then put your your name. Okay, so I'm Christine. Yeah. All right. All right. Snowflake garden is up and running. I'm gonna give this to Dave. Great. So I'm gonna copy and paste this OCAP and URI. So this is the, and I'm gonna copy this, give it to Dave. Let's see, Dave is on a different screen. So I actually have to uh, pull that over. Um, hopefully not expose, you know what? I'm gonna avoid exposing who knows what's on the other screen. I'm just gonna pull up Dave through here because Dave needs this link. Or you know what, I can put it in the chat, this thing. Uh, you know, yep. anybody else can join this thing if they want to, too. All right, there, it's in the chat. <laughs> we can um, figure it out. Yeah, yeah. If you can figure out how to boot up Dave's garden and join just in time for this presentation, then you, then you can do it, too. So, all right, there's the... Um, oh, yeah, that was the previous thing. So, I gave I gave Dave the uh, the thing in the chat here, So and I gave you all access to it, too. So, um, yeah, here's my snowflake garden. So, I'm going to I'm gonna plant... I'm going to start out by planting a cabbage right here. And I'm hoping that Dave will add something delightful as well. Yep, I am. Oh, it loaded for me. Okay. Uh, I'm going to add, we're going to be friends. The, well, the plants are going to be friends. Okay. I'm going to put a sunflower directly next to it. Oh, very nice. Well, I'm going to continue this pattern. Ooh, let's make a little checkerboard. You oh, can... yeah, I've made checkerboards a bunch of times while testing this. I don't know. Ooh, something yeah. satisfying about it. Yeah, there is something satisfying about it, right? And ooh, this feels very cooperative, right? So, so what's really interesting about this here is, and and let's see, does the REPL tell me th what you're doing? I forget. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So it's There's showing log, yeah. ant. I guess it's Dave. Dave's the ant. I planted the sunflower and blah blah blah. So in this particular example, um, uh, the um, oh, that's someone else. <laughs> oh, somebody else joined. Oh, I think cool. someone else figured out how. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, very curious. All right. Um, welcome, whoever ma else managed to connect to this in time. Um, so, uh, uh, oh, I'm guessing it was antlers. Um, anyway, congratulations. That that's a shocking, uh, um, shocking that anybody had this up and running and was able to jump join in that amount of time. Um, uh, but anyway, the the what's really cool about this is um, let's look at the actual code for this for this right here so dave defined this botanist here this garden gate this garden so the botanist says who is and isn't allowed to put plants in the garden and you can see this is not too many lines of code the garden gates just for if you want to check to see if a plant's allowed and then here's the garden right um and then here's some sort of garden community which is an abstraction over the garden that also like keeps track of um, you know, who's joined, who's, who's, uh, planting and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, it's what we expose over a cabin. It's yeah. Just an abstraction for that purpose. Now what's interesting here is Dave, when you programmed all this stuff before you hooked it up to Ocapin, um, did you program it working with the network? No, I did not. Okay. So explain, explain to me what your programming process was like when you built this demo. Sure. So this started from the, the REPL essentially, um, and I thought about what actors I wanted in my system, and I started writing these definitions. Of course, they weren't um, fully fleshed out like this. I would um, write an actor constructor um, and then attempt to test it, and it was all within um, my REPL like scheme process, my scheme console. And so I would just get the actors to behave the way I wanted them to completely locally, so um, not, not thinking about the network at all. And then once you have the, um, so what's what's neat about that then is that um, you just hooked it up to the network. You then added the, the code to hook it up to the network after you'd already verified the thing worked and it just worked, right? Yep. So that's that's one of the wild things. So this is what's, when you hear us talking about sprightly goblins, this is the big thing that sprightly goblins provide. So this is, when you see distributed programming OCAPs, this is the what we mean. Distributed programming OCAPs, um, programming language OCAPs, 
have the same convenience for any asynchronous programming that you're doing that you would have for um, for asynchronous programming over the network as you would for asynchronous programming that you're doing locally. Um, so, um, so, but what's interesting is you could see that there was accountability here. Now, in this particular case, the person who was connecting gave their own name, right? But you could imagine Dave says, okay, you know what? I, I want, I'm going to hand this capability out to, you know, to, to Christiane. And Christine, I'm going to hold accountable for this particular. Um, this is a person that I think of as Christine um, doing, uh, ha having access to this uh, particular um, capability, right? So Dave could pre choose the name for a person who's connecting, and then I couldn't be anybody other than Christine, basically. It would be the person that Dave thinks of as Christine that he's holding accountable. Um, and then so, I could revoke you if you were to misbehave in my garden. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So, um, so I didn't really prepare. So I want to actually ask, where do people want to go? Do people want to see a live demo of programming in goblins? Do people just want to talk about OCAPs, how they apply to the Fediverse? Um, what are they? What are people thinking? What's interesting? This has been left very open for the audience's interests. OK, MCC slash Andy has questions. Please ask questions, and I will respond. Um, okay. Uh, so my, my first question is said that you simply said, if such and such a person, if you decide this person is behavior, you can revoke their capability. How do you do that? Sure. Like, how is it implemented? Sure. Okay. So we have a paper um, called, um, it is the heart of Sprightly, Sprightly Core, open it up here. Um, source is in org mode, but it exports to HTML. Um, let's see, do I have Firefox open? I can also, I'll, I'll go to Sprightly. Um, I'll, I'll link it in the chat. Uh, heart of Sprightly. Yeah. So this paper actually explains how to do a whole bunch of this stuff, how it works. Um, uh, and and the, as for the question of whether it's a it's a programming language agnostic network protocol, the network protocol is programming language agnostic. The particular, but some of the features that you that you might see, the level of integration, um, the uh, some of the things that we haven't talked about, like the time traveling distributed debugger and stuff like that, just implementing the network protocol doesn't give you all those powers by default. Um, Goblins is built so that it has tight coupling between the, or that it has tight integration, not tight coupling, tight integration between the programming uh, uh, language and the network la layer stuff. Um, and uh, ha ha, how could you inline this, uh, um, mainline this in something like Mastodon? That is a heck of a question right there. Let me show off a, so this paper shows off a bunch of things about how to be able to do this. So there is a there's section that says Sprightly Goblins Distributed Transactional Programming. And there's um, and it shows off some a bunch of examples in here. Um, the but then it gets to um, where is it? Uh, capability security. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is this is the right section. So it shows off how to um, uh, after Taste of Goblins, it gets to security as relationships between objects. And this is a section that shows off how to be able to build a blog with revocable behavior. So it says, okay, here we're going to, you know, um, this person's going to make this blog. Um, they're going to uh, create the ability for people to edit it. Um, and they create uh, the ability to revoke things and stuff like that. But what you, you actually want to see an example. So why don't I just show an example live? Um, let's say, let's create something interesting. So use... Modules goblets. So I'm going to define a vat as being a spawn vat, and then enter vat a vat. This allows me to program directly inside the vat, um, and I'm going to make um, interesting thing, right? Uh, and the interesting thing, um, let's see here. Use modules goblins actor lib methods. Um, I'm also going to import cells. Uh, okay. So um, the interesting thing is, let's say that it's got, um, uh, so let's, let's put, let's give it two methods. One of them is uh, set interesting thing um, and the val, right? So maybe this by default 
has some sort of val, um, and then we'll say, okay, you can set the interesting thing of the val, um, and then it is, um, becomes the new version of interesting thing, thing with the val. Um, uh, and then you can get the interesting, and it'll just return the val. So this, this, this top one allows you to change the behavior, and the bottom one um, allows you to just get it. So we can define uh, thingy as being uh, spawn and interesting thing. Just thing. FYI, you made a typo in the getter, so just make sure you copy that typo or, or fix it now. You know what? You... This was foolish. Why am I typing this stuff live? Why didn't I just use a normal cell? Okay, all right. You know what? Let's, let's just make an ordinary chest, right? And so the, the chest is spawn... So, so this chest, if I do, um, uh, I can use dollar to do an invocation against ch the chest. So if I do um, just an ordinary invocation against the chest, it tells me what's in it, which is by default nothing, right? And then I can put gold in the chest, right? And I get gold back, and then I can put a sword in the chest, and then I can get it back. Uh, well, maybe I want to give Dave access to be able to read from this chest, but I don't want to give Dave access to write to this chest. So what I could do is I could do uh, read only cell, right? And so when I called it with no arguments, it would get, and when I called it with two arguments, it would set, right? So read only cell, um, and it's got the val, uh, or it's got the uh, proxy uh, me, and what it's going to do is it's going to take... Um, it's only going to allow invoking the proxy me uh, with no arguments. So it only it doesn't even support any other number of arguments. So what I can do is I can say for Dave is spawn read only cell. Um, oop, and what did I do wrong here? You got to pass the chest. Oh yeah, that's right. Thanks, Dave. But as you can see, the debugger came up here and told me I did things wrong. Um, okay, so um, then I can do, so for Dave, um, will tell me the sword, but I can't set it to be, I can't put, you know, fool's gold in here, because it'll just say that's, that's, I don't support that, wrong number of arguments, because it only, it only supported, it only passed through the one thing, right? Um, it just simply didn't implement the version with two arguments, right? As you can see, it just accepts no arguments and invokes this, right? Well, can we take the same idea? And say, how about revocable? Read only cell. And actually, I'm going to do, or actually, you know what? How about this? Spawn revocable. Um, uh, spawn revocable is going to do, what this is going to do is, it says proxy me. And what it's going to do is it's going to say um, uh, proxy. So the proxy takes a become argument. It's going to... And I'm going to do define uh, um, revoked is spawn cell, which starts out as false. And the proxy is going to, um, it's going to just take a procedure that takes any number of arguments. And it's just going to apply um, the proxy, uh, dollar sign, proxy me with the arguments. So this just passes through anything, but it only does it with if revoked, so if it's revoked, it's going to throw an error, you know, and otherwise else it's going to do this. So, and then I'm going to do define um, revoker, and actually I don't even need to do that. I can just return the revoked. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do values um, spawn proxy and revoked. So now I'm going to do spawn revocable. Um, for Dave, right? So I'm going to do, um, so maybe Dave is actually handing this to someone else. Maybe Dave is handing this to, um, uh, handing it to, uh, Andy actually, right? So maybe Dave, maybe I've given Dave access, but Dave doesn't quite trust Andy. So for Andy, Andy, and, um, and what's, what we're going to do here is we're going to get two things back, right? So um, so this is actually define values for Andy and revoke um, Andy revoked. So let's see here. So we've got for Andy, 
which is a proxy, and Andy revoked is a cell. So if Andy tries involve, invoking for Andy, um, sure enough, Andy can get access to the sort. But if Dave um, says, you know what? Uh, I'm going to set revoked to true. Uh, no. Oh, right, you know, Andy revoked. So I'm going to set that to true, and then Andy tries to call revoked again. It's going to say, um, what did I do wrong? Oh, right, this. Uh, that was wrong. Yeah, sorry. Um, and then Andy and then Andy tries to call for and Andy again. It says, in error, raise exception, already revoked, right? So Andy can't call it at this point. Um, the reason for that is if we look at our original code, um, we actually set up this cell to store a value, and it's storing it with false, but it's saying basically if this ever gets changed, then Andy can't get access to it. But what you can see is this is just ordinary function composition, right? Um, we've just created a mutable cell, and then we're just saying, okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to break this thing apart into two pieces. There's this thing that Dave has access to, which allows for removing access to the person that Dave gave it to, and then there's this, uh, um, and then we, this specific object, which passes through arguments, but, um, but not, not once the revocation occurs. Does that make sense? Andy, I'm asking you specifically. Okay, wait, I see you said something. Here, so if I read this right, Christine created a revocable Dave capability and gave it to Dave. And then Dave created, well, in this case, I didn't actually, the one that I created for Dave wasn't revocable. It was attenuated. It had reduced amount of methods it, so that it could only get but not set. But I did give that to Dave. And then Dave creates a revocable ca capability and gave it to me, Andy, correct. And if Christine then revokes the capability, how does Andy find out? So the fourth network on the observer, Ant, how does Ant know when Christine or Dave revokes my capabilities? So you have to compose these abstractions, right? So these, the, the baseline of goblins is just this very minimal world, right? It's just actors, right? But what we have on top of that is various other abstractions for, you know, publish, subscribe, and all sorts of other things like that. What you're seeing here is the fundamental layer to allow communication and collaboration that's very general. It's for distributed programming. Um, what you want on top of this, then, is a series of common patterns for things like, you know, notifications, right? So in ActivityPub, when I you know, um, when I, you know, favored somebody's message, they get a notification saying I favorited their message and stuff like that. We also want patterns for, you know, if I, you know, if I'm removing somebody's access, it, you know, what you're not seeing here is anything resembling a GUI, right? What you're seeing here is a, the lowest level abstraction for building peer-to-peer -peer applications. What Sprightly is not just trying to build distrib distributed programming layer. We are in year one. Year one is focused on the the lowest level component, which is our um, our programming language tools. Uh, year two is where we're starting to focus on a developer-oriented version of kind of the um, the interfaces for a social network. And years three and four is where we start scaling out to then kind of community adoption and, and then eventually kind of the world. Um, so right now, um, the, uh, yeah. So uh, Mick says, I'm assuming there are tools which audit the OCAP behavior of functions. Uh, sort of. Um, auditors are an interesting topic. Um, we that is a big topic in and of itself. Um, let's get to that in a minute. Uh, Andy, what <coughs> I want to ask is if did I answer your questions? Yes. Okay. Andy says yep. Can I ask your question? Yep. Yes, um, please. Um, so if this is if this is distributed. There's a copy of this software running on my computer and on your computer, correct? There is, it is distributed in that you're, it's distributed collaboration. It doesn't mean that you and I are necessarily running the same software on both computers. Um, it means yeah, that, I'm wondering, so. yeah, yeah. There may be components that I'm running on my computer that you, that you just aren't bothering, right? Maybe I'm running a printer server. You don't necessarily need to be running that printer server on your computer. Um, in the case of the garden demo, Dave and I were running the same software. Um, the network protocol does not particularly take care of uh, making sure we are running the same software. Um, so there is still kind of some API boundary stuff that you end up dealing with when you end up connecting two together two things. Um, uh, so yeah. my question is, like, I can understand how, how you can write software in the way that you've said, like, this person should be able to have these um, 
have these permissions to author or not author or, or read or not read, but that's those are just boundaries defined by the software. How do you prevent me from running like a naughty version of the software, which is like, ha ha ha, I don't care about that. I'm just going to write things anyway or read things anyway. I You can't read or write that's anything annoying. I haven't given you access to on my computer. You could read and write stuff on your computer. If you want to write the files you have access to on your computer. If you need access to things on your computer and I've take, got a copy of them, how do you... How do you take that back? Does I, it let you take well, that back? I just showed you the revoking pattern. So I can use a revocation pattern to be able to take things back, right? Also, when you sever a connection, the capabilities are severed in general, and um, uh, you need to reconnect with them. So there's the amount that you have to take care of with revocation mm -hmm. is important, but uh, um, that's actually going down a, a rabbit hole. Um, that's some weird Mark Miller's dissertation shit. So I'm gonna I'm gonna back off for that one. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Uh, the um, is in terms of being able to sever things. It's basically I've given you access to certain capabilities. I am setting up the patterns by which I might give you access and revoke access to those various capabilities. Um, how do you make so I'm I'm trying to get a um, I'm only giving you access to let's let me put it this way. I'm only giving you access to particular capabilities that I'm uh, intentionally handing you. Everything is like granting consent, right? You know, um, the uh, I'm not sure quite what your question is. It seems like you're having a disconnect as in terms of that, but I don't know what that means. Um, yeah, I think it's just I don't understand the model completely, but like, I mean, there's nothing to, to stop me. You give, like, if you've given me read access and then I read something and then store that locally, you, you can't take that back. It's the screenshot problem, right? Yeah, I wasn't claiming that, that we've solved the uh, um, data copying uh, yeah. revocation. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I'm talking about uh, the capability to, to, to do and continue to do things. Yeah. Um, uh, the yeah. the, the um, Distributed deletes is an interesting co conversation, as you well know. Um, uh, but that, that's, that's, that's what we're talking about here is revoking access to be able to perform operations. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, would, it, would it help if I said that, like, when you give someone a reference to an actor and you use it on another machine, like you don't have all of the state associated with that actor, you just have like a reference. So in this case, the revocable thing, if you send a message to it to like read it, read from it. That message has to go across to the machine it came from, which will then deny you if it was revoked. So you you can't actually circumvent that from another machine. That's right. Um... Right. There's another. There's another aspect. Um, so I'm I'm working on systems which are sort of very delay tolerant. Is this all assuming real time sort of connection? Like, so in, in the systems I work with. I might have been given the capability to write something and you may have revoked it, but I haven't connected to you to understand that yet. And so I write some stuff, then the revoke comes into effect. Does uh, got, how does, yeah. So, so there's two, two things here. Um, so um, the, well, let's, let's handle this in two chunks. So um, the first chunk is, does this require real time connections? Um, so what we have is, what we're working on is something called OCAPN. It is the Object Capability Network. Um, uh, where is the OCAPN? Right up. Um, I guess it's in here. Yeah, so OCAPN is basically, it's an implementation of CAPTP. Um, this is not a great way to pull this up. Um, I guess if I have Firefox open. I can show it off there. That's probably better. Uh, um, there is OCAPN is basically a um, let's see here. Um, this is the OCAPN pre-standards group that we're working on things. Um, it provides mul uh, multiple layers of abstraction. So the one of them is that it provides a capability transport protocol called CAPTP, which is where this idea of being able to do real-time communication with and um, with like, um, so CAPTP uh, is is what ends up handling the interconnection of objects across different machine boundaries. 
Um, but there is, um, but it's actually made gen gener general in that you have, it can run on top of different kinds of generalized net layers. So Dave and I were showing it off with Tor Onion services, which are very slow. You can also use libp2p and other things like that. But we, you notice there's this joke here. You could also perhaps use carrier pigeons with backpacks full of encrypted micro SD cards. So the high latency um, scenario is supported at the net layer layer level. So you can you can basically choose which net layers that have different connection properties are important to you. Now the question about revocation though comes in as in terms of if I end up giving you access to something, and um, let's say Dave gives uh, Andy access to be able to read um, from this cell, and then Dave regrets it. Um, can Dave revoke Andy's access if Dave has been offline, right? If Dave is not able to reach um, the revoker, right? Um, so by default, the answer in the way that I constructed it would be no, right? You know, Dave, it would have to be, Dave would have to get online to send a message to that revoker saying, hey, 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 I want to I wanna pull Andy's, uh, you know, I want to pull Andy's access away. Sorry, we're, we're done. Right, you know, but what you could also do if it was important to that scenario is you could set up a dead man switch, right? Which is that Andy's access is actually requiring a constant refresh on Dave's part um, to constantly say, you know, hey, you you have access, you have access again, you have access again, and if Dave is not connecting, that it would actually um, sever the connection automatically. Um, so that's another way that you can end up implementing this if you're concerned about high latency environments, and the you, in that scenario you have to basically make a, a decision between. Um, is access to the resource more important as in terms of the risk of it being severed because you're not there or it being severed or um, somebody continuing to have access because you aren't there to sever it, right? Um, those are those are the decisions. And, and Goblins at a low level does not make this decision. It provides, provides the compositional tools to be able to make these decisions, if that makes sense. Um, let's see here. Ooh, they put my animated version of the witch up now. That's nice. Uh, I love the animated version. <laughs> yes. Uh, so let's see here. What's, what's the, when's the next session? I just want to make sure when we're, if we're not running over or not. We just hit the break time. So it'd be okay. a So it seems like we hit a good break time. Uh, do we want to stop here? Does anybody have one more question that, um, that they want to ask? The question. next session is uh, you ranting about whatever you want slash other people want you to, right? That's true. So the next session is going to be me and me ranting and rambling, which means that you could continue things here. Uh, in the meanwhile, I will accept one more question if there is any, but otherwise I'll got it's going, going, gone on that uh, for somebody to do it. Otherwise, else you can always do it in the next session. Let's see somebody typing. Can I recap the roadmap? Yes. So year one is... Um, is we are focusing on uh, the low-level developer tools. So that is like the um, the stuff that, I, that Dave and I have been kind of showing you all at this particular conference, which is the programming tools. Year two is um, user interfaces for developers to play around with um, that are like chat room programs and stuff like that, but they're not expected to be usable by others. It's really more dogfooding between us and uh, developer community. Um, to get the core concepts down. Year three is kind of like, let's say, Mastodon, where it was about six or seven years ago, right? You know, like maybe about six years ago, um, or maybe five. I don't remember when. Time is weird, right? Five years ago, right? So five years ago, Mastodon, you know, it's great for people who um, are really dedicated to the idea of decentralized networks. But, um, but for people who are not that dedicated, you know, they're not maybe not willing to put up with the pain. You know, so what we're aiming for in year uh, four is to try to be at the space where it's, you know, usable really for everyone. Um, you don't have to be as hardcore of a user as us to be able to, you know, pick up and be playing with these things. Now, this is all ambitious. These are the goals. I'm just stating you the goals out loud. Um, uh, but that's that's kind of the roadmap for where you should expect our focuses are. So if this seems very low level, very technical, very oriented around particular um, like, you know, programming implementation details, that's because it intentionally is. The problem is, so here's the end summary. It is too hard today to build peer-to-peer end-to-end encrypted applications. Way too hard. Um, we are lowering the barrier dramatically on being able to do that. So Dave's Community Garden is a great example of that. And we're also lowering the assumption that, you know, there's distinction between things, things that are social and uh, things that are not. 
right? You know, everything should be able to be networked and collaborative if you want it to be, right? You know, the the moment that a networked version of an office suite comes out, the non-networked versions of the office suite are doomed, right? Because the value of collaboration is just so high to have a networked version, right? So, um, you know, but, you know, right now the prevailing way that you do something like that is, well, it's easiest to implement a, you know, a centralized version of things or you have to spend a lot of time thinking about bespoke things at the network perimeter. You don't have to do that with goblins. You can focus on the application at hand. So that's a pitch. That's a summary. Uh, oh, yeah. Could we go faster with more resources? Absolutely, we can get faster with more resources. You want to give us more resources? Let us know. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. Donations to us are tax deductible. And if you want to talk about other things, uh, you want to talk about uh, supporting us, uh, send me a message. Uh, I'm Christine at Sprightly.Institute. And that is it. We are done with this talk. Thank you, everybody.